I'll be talking about the sustainable investing trends that we see in Asia. But before deep diving into the content, let me just give you a, a quick uh, overview of how we approach sustainable investing at Robico. I think Don already gave a pretty good introduction on what is our strategic view on it. We're an active manager uh, with a long-term time horizon. And for us, our key goal is to provide investment return to our client while also allowing them to um, achieve their sustainability goals. So we have over 25 years of experience in this field. We didn't start yesterday. We have built a very extensive capabilities in terms of our investment and our SI expertise to really be able to cater to these needs from our client. For that, we have developed a strategy on how to approach sustainable investing across our funds and also in the way that we operate. And just to highlight a couple of the key points from this strategy, we recognize that our clients are actually starting in different points from their sustainability journey. And that means that we need to have a different set of solutions to make sure that we are basically catering to the needs of our client base. And besides that, we believe that having that high quality ESG data is very important to make sure that we can really gather all those insights that we get from our uh, analysts from the SI research team to build uh, and have better informed investment decisions. And finally, building partnerships, and that's why we're all here today, right? So collaborating with our clients and with other stakeholders like WWF and other important players in the industry to further advance the work on sustainable investing. So Don already explained how we organize ourselves when it comes to sustainable investing. And it's good to mention that we have really consolidated all the sustainability knowledge that we have, <coughs> excuse me, across the organization under a, a specific domain called the SI Center of Expertise. And this is important because it enables us to really share all the knowledge that we have in-house on how to tackle sustainability with our clients, with our investment teams, and with the broader market. So we have the thought leadership team looking into the strategic direction of Robico on topics like climate and SDGs. We have SI research, which look beyond the ESG data that we get from Sustainalytics and MSCI and other data providers and try to translate that into concrete, actionable recommendations for our colleagues in the investment teams on how they should be looking at sustainability topics when selecting stocks and constructing their portfolios. The third team is active ownership. So here is more about how do we engage with our investee companies to really steer them towards more sustainable business practices. And finally, the SI client portfolio management team, which basically acts as a bridge between bringing all the knowledge that we have in SI and sharing it with clients. So we are here today to discuss the trends, right? What are we seeing ahead? And how does this apply to the Asian context? And probably all of you will agree with me that the most pressing one in the short term relates to the rise of sustainable investing regulation. And we've seen this happening across many jurisdictions, and certainly here in Asia, there are a lot of um, moving pieces in terms of taxonomy development, um, defining stewardship codes, and that certainly keeps us busy to make sure that our businesses are up to speed in terms of all these developments but it also gives us a key opportunity to be involved in the consultations that you know, stakeholders like the MIS and other uh, regular, regulatory setting organizations are putting forward to get the input from the financial industry on how to best allocate capital towards more sustainable business practices. So at Rubico, we've been actively involved in engaging with um, you know, the European Commission on the SFDR, here in Singapore with MIS and the new taxonomy that is being developed, also in Indonesia, in other markets, trying to bring our perspective into the discussion. Of course, the second trend when we talk about sustainable investing, I think climate change is really on top of everyone's agenda. So not only investors, also companies, also regulators, civil society. And what I think it's important to highlight here is that climate change is not only about the risks that we see ahead. And we all heard about transition risks and physical risks, but there are also quite some opportunities that need to be taken into account. 
So if we look at the Asian context, and more specifically Southeast Asia, the trend that we've seen in the last 20 years is a massive increase in economic growth, increase in GDP, also an increase in population, and that has been coupled by a need of an increasing energy demand, which has been serviced mainly by fossil fuels. And that translates, of course, also an increase in CO2 emissions in the region. And what has been happening while all these trends unfolded in front of us is that regulators and governments have also defined net zero emission commitments by 2050 or 2060 here in the region as well. So there is a certain limitation in terms of what we can do in terms of growth relying on fossil fuels in the next years. So it is estimated that in the next 20 years, the economic growth will continue in this region and also will do the, the same with the population growth. And in fact, the energy demand is expected to double in the next two decades. And it is clear that we won't be able to fully rely on fossil fuels to sort of fulfill that energy demand needs. So that brings me to the actual investment opportunity or you know, more of the positive angle within this entire story of how can we play a role as investors to facilitate that transition towards more clean energy sources. The International Energy Agency has published a report pointing out what type of investments are needed on clean energy across different years to make sure that we reach a net zero uh, scenario by 2050. And if you look at this chart, what it's basically telling us is that Asia Pacific will play a key role in really facilitating that capital allocation towards renewable energies because there will be a huge demand for renewable energies here in the region to meet all the energy growth and uh, economic growth that is expected. So 45% of the market size for clean energies by 2050 will actually be concentrated in Asia Pacific. So how are investors actually looking at this here in the region? How are they taking into account both those risks as we spoke about around climate change, but also the opportunities? At Robico, every year we outline a um, climate change survey that we basically compile, reaching out to 300 clients, institutional and wholesale across different regions. And what we found is that here in APAC, uh, there has been a certain increase in terms of year-on-year -year figures on how investors are incorporating climate change in their investment policies. And on top of that, one-third of the respondents to the survey here in APAC actually have set uh, commitments to achieve net zero by 2050. And they expect to move towards the carbonization rate uh, in the next five years. So the way that we take that feedback from, from our clients, also from regulators, is by also looking inwards and defining our own climate strategy as an organization. So we have committed to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 as well. And we have outlined a very comprehensive uh, roadmap on how to basically achieve this goal. And here I just included the summary. The actual plan is more than 40 pages long. Um, but basically, it has two components. One top-down approach, looking at the first pillar on how to decarbonize our assets. So both uh, looking at our portfolios, but also at our operational emissions. And then we also want to bring that bottom-up approach to the, to the discussion. So you can fundamentally you know, ask whether if we stop investing in fossil fuels in 20 years down the line, if there will be any change in the emissions that are being you know, generated into the atmosphere. And probably the answer is no, because someone else might go and buy it. So that's why it's so important to take that bottom-up approach and really try to accelerate the transition by talking to our investee companies and engaging with them so they can really move towards the energy transition strategy at a much faster pace. And the same goes with the governments trying to push for better regulations around climate action. But that's only one side of the story. 
the third pillar is also about collaborating with our clients to make sure that they are also working together with us on how to decarbonize their assets and how to collaborate as an industry to really make sure that we are able to reach that net zero ambition by 2050. The last trend that we see ahead, and Don already alluded to that, is a move towards a real world impact, right? So the best framework to use here when we talk about impact is looking at the SDGs. And the Sustainable Development Goals basically outline the set of priorities that we should have as a society to tackle the most pressing development challenges. So it's estimated that at the current pace of um, progress that we see here in APAC, the SDGs will only be achieved by 2065. And especially due to COVID and um, to some extent as well, climate change and some natural related disasters that we've seen in the last years, there has been certainly a delay on the, the pace of progress that happened in the last years. So it is imperative that the financial industry also plays a role to make sure that we work towards achieving those SDGs. And then this brings me to the next topic of double materiality. So how do we change the paradigm in the way that we look at companies when we talk about sustainability? So historically, we've all been really focused on the left side of the chart. So really that outside in perspective. So how is the company in my portfolio being impacted by the sustainability challenges that happen out there in the society and the environment? How is an oil and gas company going to be affected by climate change? How will that impact their business model? That's what we do when we integrate ESG considerations in our investment processes. And it's a very important assessment to make because it gives you a fundamental basis of how, uh, you know, the company is dealing with these risks and opportunities related to these external factors. However, there is a second discussion taking place in the last years, and it tries to bring the, the other side of the story into perspective. So looking at the inside out part. So how is the company that I'm holding in my portfolio impacting the society or the environment through the products and services that they provide or the operations that they run. And that's where the discussion is moving towards now and trying to find the different tools that we have as investors to really enact that inside out perspective and bring it into our portfolio construction process. And to do that, we have developed a framework internally to try to translate the way that companies contribute to the sustainable development goals because there are 17 goals and 100 plus indicators. And then if we wanna understand how companies can really contribute and play a part to tackle these pressing development related challenges, it is important that we can quantify that. So the framework that we have put together, it's been already in place for a number of years. We basically take a three step approach to be able to quantify that impact. The first one is looking at the products. So what is the company producing? So if we're talking about the drug manufacturer, uh, the type of medicines that are rolled out in the market, that inherently has a positive impact on topics like public health. The second step will look at how the companies are producing these products. So if we talk again about this um, drug manufacturing company, we'll look at their supply chain structure, how are suppliers treated, what type of governance structures are in place within the company. And finally, we'll assess whether there are any controversies that we need to take into account when defining the final contribution. In this case, if there are any bribery and corruption cases, for instance. So all these insights enable us to give a SG score to, to the company. And we're able to understand how the company is contributing either in a positive way, neutral or negative way, to the sustainable development goals. And by having this score at hand, this enables us to integrate it in the investment process, in the way that we look at companies, we, we choose uh, uh, the basically underlying holdings for our fund, and also in the way that we construct our portfolios. And finally, the last point on real world impact and uh, important one, it relates to 
that active ownership responsibility that we take as investors. So we are holding bonds and shares from a wide range you know, number of companies. And why is this important? Because we can leverage that influence and have a discussion with our investees and try to nudge them towards more sustainable business practices. So every year we engage with about 200 companies on different ESG topics. We also engage with governments and we vote at shareholder meetings around uh, 8,000 per year. And for us, this is a very powerful way to convey our message on what type of sustainability challenges companies need to take on board and how they can improve their practices. And just to give you a flavor of what engagement is about, I would like to uh, display the video of um, my conversation with Helge Munkel, the Chief Sustainability Officer of DBS. So we've been engaging with DBS under our engagement program where we look at the climbing the um, banking sector and a range of holdings that we have in that industry, how they are tackling the climate change risks and opportunities across our business. So in this conversation with Helge, we talk about this topic and we also discuss about the power of shareholder engagement and how DBS has benefited from having these dialogues with Robico to shape their internal sustainability strategy. So maybe if we can play the video. To limit global warming to two degrees, $93 trillion of investment are needed by 2030. That means that the financial sector plays a crucial role to transition towards a low carbon economy. Robico has been engaging with the banking sector to better understand how the industry is tackling the climate change related risks and opportunities across our business strategy. This is part of our broader engagement efforts where we have constructive dialogues with our investee companies to try to steer them towards more sustainable business practices. So one of the companies we engage with is TBS, the Singapore based banking group providing financial services and uh, products to retail and institutional clients. So I'm delighted to be joined by Helge Munkel, DBS's chief sustainability officer, to talk about their broader sustainability um, policies and priorities, as well as, as their road towards achieving net zero by 2050. So thank you so much for joining today, Helga. Thanks, Laura. So the first question is more a fundamental one. How does your organization actually look at the broader risks and opportunities related to climate change, especially using those Asian lenses to embed that in your business strategy? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you so much, Laura. Let me maybe first set the context a little bit and indeed more broadly describe how DBS goes about sustainability because we have indeed developed a fairly comprehensive approach to sustainability and we've identified three different pillars. The first pillar, we call it responsible financing. That is all about us empowering our clients to being more sustainable. And the cornerstone piece of this is indeed that in the run up to COP26 late last year, we were the first Singapore bank to be committing ourselves to being net zero in our financed emissions, our scope three, if you will, by 2050. Pillar two is what we call responsible business practices. And that's more around how we conduct ourselves as an organization. It cuts across many different areas, such as diversity and inclusion. And on the environmental side, again, we are committed to being net zero in our own emissions, in our own operations, sorry, i.e. our scope one and two by the end of this year, by the end of 2022. And then we have pillar three, which we call impact beyond banking. Here we support um, entrepreneurs that have a triple bottom line as well as community causes. And our board has just approved another 100 million Singapore dollars to really support this. So as we go about defining these three pillars and what we really want to do there, one important part of the homework always is what we call a materiality assessment. And we have actually um, transparently disclosed this in our annual report as well as in our sustainability report, how and when and how often we actually reach out to all our key stakeholders, Rebico as an investor being one of them, but also our employees, our suppliers, our shareholders, and so on and so forth. And this outside in view is really very important for us to identify what is actually really material. And there are quite a few material issues that we want to tackle. As we also all know, there are many sustainability challenges that we face, but climate is clearly a core priority, firstly, because it's very urgent, and secondly, because it's intrinsically linked 
to other sustainability challenges as well. What is important is, I think, to get the governance structure right. So in order to move forward in the future and to actually force ourselves into this dialogue and really be ambitious on our path forward, we need to have a good governance structure, which we have enhanced by having now a board sustainability committee, which really sets the strategic direction and oversees everything that we do on sustainability. And importantly, maybe at the very end, we really believe that we can only tackle the sustainability challenges as part of a wider ecosystem change. Nobody can tackle it alone. We really need governments and regulators, the private sector, as well as financial institutions to come together, everybody playing its part. And one core piece for us as a bank is really the reallocation of capital. Not the only one, but an important one, away from unsustainable activities towards more sustainable activities, which we're now going to operationalize going forward as part of our net zero commitment. Thanks for sharing that. And we heard that DBS has set that concrete target on achieving net zero emissions by 2050. You have built a very robust internal governance structure to really oversee your climate ambitions. But what are the additional steps that you really need to take in the short and medium term to make sure that you can really fulfill that long term commitment around uh, climate change related topics? Yeah, absolutely, Laura. So what we've done in the past is really, really hard, dirty, sweaty work on ESG data and modeling. So it was actually a huge undertaking and quite a huge challenge to source the right data, to take informed decisions and to put models together that address both the risks and the opportunities. So we have now integrated ESG into our risk management framework. We are integrating ESG into our front office units and how they engage with clients. And that was very, very hard work and it will continuously be uh, part of our work because we will get better data, uh, we will need to adjust our models and so on and so forth. But that was a very, very important step. The most important next step is to get all of this out of the boardroom into the trenches. DBS has 33,000 employees and in the end of the day what we want is that everybody is empowered, motivated, and knows how to support. And of course, one of the most important drivers here is the way we interact with our clients, because we can only be net zero by 2050 if we work together with our clients in a collaborative approach, IDA together and empower them and finance their transition. So we need to really focus a lot on internal capacity building. So our relationship managers need to have the right tools, the right information, and also be personally empowered to have this dialogue with the client. So there's a lot on um, uh, capacity building internally. Then there are many, many other levers that you still have to uh, pull and push. Number one, everything starts with purpose. And at DBS, our purpose is to be the best bank for a better world. So instilling this purpose into the organization is very critical. To have the culture so that people really fully understand that. You need to set the governance structure, as I said, but going forward also set the KPIs in a certain way that people are incentivized to really move forward very, very quickly. So there are lots of hard and soft levers that we really still have to push and pull to move forward. And we clearly have a, have a few key challenges. Number one is indeed ESG data, especially in Asia. We still have a lot of loopholes effectively in our data sets and in our models simply because the data is generally not available. So how do we address this? Um, another key point in Asia is also the social element. We have prioritized climate because we think it's urgent, but we must not forget the social part. And we actually believe you have to tackle climate and the social element concurrently. So example, if we were to, in Southeast Asia somewhere, accelerate the phase down of coal, which is the right thing to do from a carbon budget point of view, how do we support the families that are currently dependent on the income from a coal miner? So you really need to have a more holistic approach to also really um, cover the social element and not only climate. And then there are quite a few other hard questions that we need to address. If you think about finance as a traffic light system, everyone is financing the dark green stuff. Think about electricity generation by renewables. That's a no brainer. And then there is the very dark brown stuff, which is also not going to become lighter brown or green by any time, uh, for example, electricity generation by coal. But then you have this gigantic piece in the middle, which we all refer to as transition finance. And this is really very, very complicated. And we are very committed to ideating together with our clients to actually help those businesses that today are still brown, but with the right effort can actually become less brown and potentially even green ultimately. 
Right, we heard about uh, all the different, you know, uh, stakeholders that we need to consult to make sure that, well, DBS as a group is able to sort of roll out the uh, implementation strategy to achieve your climate goals that is really realistic and takes into account like all the different needs from the different stakeholders, going from your clients to your investors to also the, the broader workforce, right, that uh, is really working hard to make that uh, policy to, to happen at the end of the day. So if we zoom into the actual, you know, added value of that dialogue that DBS has had with the investors. How do you think that the insights that you get from the dialogues that you have with your shareholder base really contributes to sort of fine tune DBS's sustainability plan and overall climate ambitions? Yeah, absolutely. I really see two key points. The first one is our stakeholder engagement helps us in our materiality assessment. That's really very, very important. But the second point is looking forward, what we really need, and I said this at the beginning, is ecosystem change. We will not be able to save the planet in a just manner alone. We all need to come together. So what we really are very focused on is building those ecosystems. And at DBS, we're also very focused on harnessing technology to do so. One example is, for example, that we were a founding shareholder as well as partner of CIX, Climate Impact X, which is a Singapore-based carbon market and exchange. So the engagement with stakeholders very much facilitates this building of ecosystems as well, which is need, needed uh, in order to unlock capital at the speed and quantum we need. Great. On that positive note, let's just uh, work together as an industry to further collaborate and make sure that we can tap into all the opportunities, uh, you know, related to the environmental challenges that we have ahead. So thank you so much for your time today, Helge. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Laura. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm.